Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We are recording this broadcast on September the 28th, 2020. A disturbing trend has emerged in the past few weeks as cases of COVID-19 continue to rise in more than half of the 50 United States. And we have passed a terrible milestone of over 200,000 Americans dead of COVID-19. With the cold weather setting in where people are more likely to be inside and transmission of the virus is even more a possibility, we're concerned about what the fall and winter months may bring. Here to discuss this with us today is our favorite expert, Dr. Greg Poland, virologist and vaccine and infectious disease expert at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks for being here again, Greg. Tell us about second wave. We've heard that term before. Is that what we are seeing right now? Well, in, in a sense, yes. In a sense, no. Um, second wave means that it has hit a community, moved on to another community, and then oftentimes the virus subtly changes and a second, a true second wave occurs. In a sense, this is happening. In a sense, not, like I say. What we're seeing is, a, and I think the better word is a resurgence of cases. Um, what is happening nationally is what I would call, and my daughter calls, COVID fatigue. People are tired of being physically distanced. They want to get back to a normal life. And so they're discounting the uninformed voices that are telling them what their itchy ears want to hear of, well, maybe you don't have to take that. This is just a problem in people that are 80 and older. Of course, that's misinformation, but there's, a, there's an emotional appeal to hearing information that fits with what your heart wants to do, which is to take off your mask and you know, hug your kids returning from college and, and everything else. So that's one issue. The other issue is college kids. You know, when you look at the hottest spots in the U.S., they've got major colleges with major outbreaks occurring. It has been a difficult thing in our society, particularly with younger people who are far less likely to get hospitalized or die, to get them to realize they have to take precautions not only so that school and the economy can continue, but it does spread. We're seeing this in, in Wisconsin, in Dane, Dane County. You bring back people from all over the US, all over the world to a university, it's like you know stacking 100 cruise ships together, right? That's what a dormitory is. And now they don't take precautions with distancing and masking, and of course, they're out in the community, so it spreads to older people. Um, and then, as you said, Helena, the, the cold weather is another factor that will drive this. This virus thrives in cold uh, uh, weather where, where the humidity is down and where people are crowded together. So you kind of put all of that together, and we're seeing major surges around the country. This is a, I, 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 my, my heart is heavy with trying to get across just how bad a sign this is going into the fall and winter. And, and we're going to have to do everything we can to convince people this is serious business that has to be attended to properly or people will get hurt. I think what you said, Greg, about COVID fatigue is really interesting because there's sort of two sides to that story. One is that people get a little bit lazy or lax when they're asked to do things repeatedly and they may not quite do them the right way. The other thing I was thinking this morning is how much I just liked having to wear a mask all of the time when, when we were first starting to wear masks. And I'm an anesthesiologist, so I've worn a lot of masks in my career. But I was walking into work today and thinking how very normal it felt to be wearing a mask now that I appreciated the fact that we could get on with our lives somewhat because we were masking and doing some of those other things that are so important. Yeah. You know, you know, you're right. For us as physicians, it, it seems kind of normal in, in many ways. My wife and I have realized we're, we're driving down the highway wearing masks and we're the only two in the car. <laughs> we, we forget and then, you know, take it off. Equally, what happens sometimes is we'll get out. We've got to go to the grocery store. We start walking toward the store and go, oh, we forgot our mask and we've got to go back to the car. Uh, and get it. So, you know, it is, it is hard to, to change human behavior. We're, we're not used to that. 
But I do want to say that there are other cultures, particularly Asian cultures, where they've been doing this for years during the context of influenza and other respiratory pathogen outbreaks. And they're quite used to it. And they find it to be of, of major benefit. We've seen that in the Southern Hemisphere. Influenza in particular and other respiratory diseases drop down to almost negligible levels because they wore their masks. And yet we have not been able to clearly institute this uh, in, in the US, in continental Europe, in, in England. This has been a problem. And uh, we're seeing Europe reflare again in a dramatic way. Um, so it's a, it's a very sad thing to, to be facing this again when we, we could have uh, kept this under check. Greg, I've been seeing reports in the, even in the news that the virus is mutating. Mm. And I'm wondering if you can explain um, to our listeners and watchers what it means for a virus to mutate and then why would that uh, make a difference? Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. The virus, uh, this is an RNA virus, which is a type of genetic material. And all RNA viruses change over time or mutate. RNA viruses do that through two mechanisms. One is during the time they're reproducing, they make mistakes in the genetic material that compose that virus. That's a mutation. The other thing that they can do is they can trade genetic material with one another called viral recombination. Both of those have and uh, both of those mechanisms are occurring. For example, when you look back January, February, even into early March, the strain of SARS-CoV-2 that was circulating changed with a single amino acid substitution, what's called a D to G641 mutation. That virus is responsible now for essentially all of the infections. There's controversy over whether it mutated to become more transmissible. It does not appear to have made it more deadly. It's about the same. But the point is that that could happen anyway. The virus could mutate to become less transmissible, less serious. Alternately, it could mutate to become more transmissible, which it apparently has. But even worse, could it mutate to become more deadly. Now, all of this is even a higher risk when we talk about antivirals and vaccines. There's a study that came out of the uh, Rockefeller Institute showing this very elegantly. They took a SARS-CoV-2 virus and they passaged it or reproduced it very rapidly through human cells in Petri dishes. And they demonstrated that it very rapidly accumulated mutations such that the virus was able to escape antibody from convalescent plasma in people who had been infected. It was able to escape monoclonal antibodies. And so the question is, if you had the wrong mutation in the wrong part of the virus, could it escape immunity induced by vaccines? And uh, I've published and others have published on this, and the answer is yes, that could absolutely happen. It does not appear to have happened yet, but that doesn't mean it won't in the future. So uh, you and I have talked and uh, we've, we've shared stories about how surprised people are when we mention to them, you know, after you get the vaccine, we're still gonna be physically distanced. We're still gonna be wearing masks. We don't know how high the protective immunity will be, and we don't know how long it will last yet. So we'll have to continue mask wearing through the winter. It makes sense to me that mutation may have um, significant, significant uh, impact upon the development of vaccines. And I know that you were at a uh, vaccine, a virtual uh, international vaccine conference yeah. uh, this week. And I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit about what's going on and, yeah. and what you're um, teaching and learning at that conference. Sure. Well, I think uh, one of the things that's uh, happening is that people feel very encouraged by the amount of collaboration and sharing that traditionally has not happened between pharmaceutical manufacturers. After all, they're competing with their products, but all of them endorse uh, the, the marvelous amount of collaboration that's occurring. Everybody endorsed just how serious these new flares are 
uh, across the world. And, and all of us, as I say, with very heavy hearts that we can't seem to get the public to hear what the scientific evidence is and to take it seriously. Um, and then concern about what's happening worldwide with colleges and schools resuming. You know, thus far at the primary school level, while there have been scattered outbreaks, it doesn't appear yet, it doesn't appear yet that that is causing uh, or sparking uh, outbreaks that spread into the community. That has been more at the high school and college level. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've been talking about things like that, new vaccine approaches, already looking forward to the second generation of vaccines that will be more temperature stable, for example. And then, as I was just describing, the concerns over the amount of viral mutation and what that could mean. Well, I can only imagine that this is an exciting year to be at a vaccine conference with all yeah. this going on. Um, although for some of us, that sounds like it might be a cure for insomnia. And I'm so <laughs> glad that there are those of you that have made that your life's work. Yeah. It's wonderful. Well, you know, part of the, the other thing that happened is all of us, you're wandering around in a forest of trees, so to speak. And all of us were struck as we talk that we're making history here. We're, we're not only living through history, but what people individually and corporately choose to do or not do is something that historians are going to look back on and ask what our role was. Did we make things better or did we selfishly make things worse? And I think that's a question that should weigh heavy on each of, our, each of our conscience, both individually and corporately. Greg, you know that one of my favorite things is questions from listeners. Yes. And we happen to have a couple okay. today uh, from a listener. His first question is, is it safe to go to the barber for a haircut? And the second part of that question is, where do you get those very professional haircuts that you get, or do you even need haircuts? <laughs> well, the, the, the second one is easy. I, I know that it looks very professional, but I have to admit to you that my wife gives me a haircut every week. She just buzzes it and it's easy. Um, I know people think that I wake up in the morning and this just happens. Uh, <laughs> you have to have a little fun. The question about a hairdresser or barber is a good one. Uh, many people are, are asking me that question. I think uh, the answer is it depends. Um, if you can be outside, and many are doing it that way, and wear a mask, you're really very safe in, in doing that. When you get indoors, I know some places aren't wearing masks. That's a very risky situation. What about something in between where you have to be indoors, particularly as we're talking about fall and winter? And I think you can do it by wearing masks, by understanding what kind of infection control procedures are being used in a place like that, and particularly how many air exchanges. Are they using air purifiers? Are they using HEPA filters? Those are things that increase the safety. And I, I know some are asking questions when they make an appointment. Please, if you have any respiratory conditions, if you are um, been around anybody who's recently been diagnosed, please let's delay your appointment. Now, not everybody adheres to that, but those are things that can be done to make it safer. That's great. Your, your wife does a lovely job on your haircuts and your <laughs> secret is safe with us. Thank you. <laughs> the second question you sort of began to mention in your answer to the haircuts, this gentleman was also curious about using the use of air purifiers. Are air purifiers helpful? Um, are they something that people should be purchasing to try to use in their homes? What are your thoughts about that? You know, that is a really good question. And the answer is generally yes. So let's just take my own example. It's just my wife and I in the house. We don't have a particular need for an air purifier. But uh, soon we're going to have kids coming back home. Uh, so we better think about one. The point is this. The more air exchanges and the cleaner that air, the lower the risk. By itself, it's not satisfactory. So what we're doing is we're, as we've talked about over the months, is we're layering protection. 
So the first would be, let's be sure the air in our home, if we're having people to our home, is as clean as it can be. That means a HEPA filter. You don't have to spend very much money to get a high quality HEPA filter air purifier, and those are helpful. And I'll just say briefly why. The virus is not expelled on its own. The virus has to attach to something, a, a microscopic piece of mucus, a, a piece of dust in the environment, and that's how it travels. A HEPA filter catches those and, and holds them there. Now you gotta change your filter at appropriate intervals. But if you're gonna have somebody to your home, masking and a filter is, and hand sanitizing and being at the best distance you can be apart is layers of protection to keep everybody safe. It's of course safer to be outdoors or if you live in an environment where you can have the windows open, that's even better in terms of air exchanges. So the answer, the short answer is yes, depends a little bit on your environment and it depends on using HEPA filtering. So we've seen that, for example, in our own institution. Uh, the air exchange rate has been increased in the ORs and in other critical places. Airlines have increased their rate of air exchange and use HEPA filters. All of those things help in conjunction with all the other things we're supposed to do, primarily mask wearing. So Greg, does the air purifier actually kill the virus or is it exchanging the air more rapidly to get rid of the virus? It's the latter. So with a HEPA filter, it's being attached electrostatically to the filter itself so that it cannot then circulate in the air, which is why changing the filters and changing them properly is so important. I just wanna reinforce one other thing, and uh, we've talked about it a lot, but I don't think you can say it uh, uh, often enough. The latest poll in the US shows that a large number of parents are not planning on getting themselves and their kids influenza immunized. And I, I just wanna plead with anybody who hears this, influenza vaccines are very, very safe and they are at least moderately effective. It will decrease your own anxiety about what does this respiratory symptom that I have represent? It will prevent you from going into um, quarantine and it will prevent a surge demand on the system which is important for somebody who may actually have COVID rather than influenza. Literally a half a second of discomfort to get an injection. You can get them so many places. It's more convenient than it's ever been. And it's really important for your health and the health of others around you. So Greg, of course, working here at Mayo Clinic, we get a flu vaccine every year, but I've been encouraging my family members who I know are not regulars in getting flu vaccines mm -hmm. to get them. Would it be, are they appropriate for most age ranges um, yes. as long as there's no contraindication to having me, one? Yeah, so there's, you know, the only contraindication is having had a very rare neurologic side effect called Guillain-Barre, a, a type of paralysis that occurred within six weeks of getting the vaccine. Influenza, the virus itself, has a much higher risk of causing Guillain-Barre. So unless you've had that or a, an acute allergic reaction, everybody six months and older, everybody six months and older in the U.S. should get a flu vaccine every year. The kids, it's easy. They can get a nasal spray vaccine. For us adults, older adults, it's a, it's a needle and an intramuscular injection. Um, so very safe to get. It's been our sincere pleasure today to have Dr. Greg Poland, who's a virologist, vaccine expert, infectious disease expert at the Mayo Clinic with us uh, to discuss the latest in COVID-19. Please remember to get your flu shot. I hope that you learned something today. I know that I did. We wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.